We're going to do some reading today. I got to prove to you that I can actually read. We are going to read Ibram X. Kendi's introduction to his book, How to Be an Anti Racist. And I think it's an important read because this is the book that your kids are going to be reading. And your college students are going to be reading, and the military is reading, and governments are reading them. It's probably an important book, and we probably, you should probably read it. I'm not just going to read the introduction, because I think the introduction is all I need to read for me to realize the book is complete BS. This is Gene, and you're listening to Dumbasses Talking Politics. Hey, hey, this is Gene. Welcome back to Dummy, Dumbasses Talking Politics, a Saturday edition. So as the last Saturday edition, this is going to be a little bit longer. I honestly do not know if I'm going to be able to get through the entire chapter of the uh, entire introduction. The introduction is only seven pages, and, but the problem is I have a ton of notes. If you actually looked at all my notes, you'd say, oh, Lord, but uh, I probably can. Um, and the other thing, a lot, do do I recommend reading this book? Like I said in the introduction, I'd say yes. I, I think it should be read. Uh, it shouldn't be taken too seriously. It should be looked very critically. And because it is, once you read the book, one can see just how foul this whole philosophy is. And maybe people will start fighting it or will actually fight it more than they are currently right now and critical race theory which started out as uh critical theory was started back in the 70s and 80s it's it's actually a rather old theory it's not something new uh barack obama before while he was just a community organizer also also worked with critical theory uh ibram x kendi was just able to articulate the theory in a very easy to read book and it's probably an easy to read book because it is so bloody simplistic so one of the things i always say is when something is based off a lie you can't take that it totally invalidates that individual's book philosophy belief system and that's exactly what this introduction does the rest of this book is completely irrelevant though it's worth reading simply because it's so out there simply because his entire introduction is a lie and his entire introduction just shows that even max candy probably has never grown up so let's get to it the introduction is titled my racist introduction and that title is probably about the most aware Ibram X. Kendi is about himself in the entire book. Uh, he is a racist. There is absolutely no question about it. And, you know, one of the bigger bigger lies in here is that he says he's learned not to be a racist, but apparently he hasn't. So let's start this up. Despised, I despise suits and ties. For 17 years, I had been surrounded by suit-wearing, tie-choking, hat-flying church folk. My teenage wardrobe hollered the defiance of a preacher's kid. It was January 17, 2000. More than 3,000 black people with a smattering of white folks arrived that Monday morning in their Sunday best at the Hilton Memorial Chapel in Northern Virginia. My parents arrived in a state of shock. Their floundering son had somehow made it to the final round of the Prince William County Martin Luther King Jr. oratorical contest. Okay, uh, I want to point something out. This happened in 2000, and he was at se- he was 17 when he was in this contest. So he was born in 1993. I also want to point out that oh, 1983. Excuse me. I also want to point out that he's never experienced either Jim Crow or slavery. And he was raised in a middle-class black family with both mother and father. Okay, so this guy had a lot of benefits. Dare I say it, privileges. All right, that he doesn't really bring up. 
He's in a speech contest. So I would assume, no, I know he, he did compete with white kids in there. So there was no real segregation or anything. And I know I was, I was alive in 1983. I was alive in 2000. I saw in 2000. So there was not this bizarre need for racism or anything like that. So let's continue. I didn't show up with, with a white collar under a dark suit and matching dark tie like most of my competitors. I sported a racy golden brown blazer with a slick black shirt and bright colored streak tie underneath. The hem of my baggy, uh, baggy slacks crested over my creamy boots. I'd already failed the test of respectability before I opened my mouth. But my parents, Carol and Larry, were all smiles nonetheless. They couldn't remember the last time they saw me wearing a tie and blazer, however loud and crazy. I failed. He failed the test of respectability? How did he fail anything? He's in the finals of an, a contest that tests his intellectual, in, in, his intel, intellect. His parents think he looks good and he's stepping out of his comfort zone by wearing what he's wearing. And by the way, what he's wearing doesn't sound like something all that bizarre. Does he... Just a, a question here. Just a question here. Does he just sound like a 17-year-old kid that might be just a tad insecure? I don't know. But so far, he failed the test of respectability. Who's... Who's... Excuse me, there's my phone. Whose test did he fail? I mean, he didn't. He does. He mentions it in a few minutes. But who's actually analyzing the guy? Right off the bat, and by the way, at seventeen, you've got these insecurities, and these insecurities do make you a little bit self-centered. But it, I think it gets worse than that later. But it wasn't just my clothes that didn't fit the scene. My competitors were academic prodigies. I wasn't. I carried a GPA PA lower than three point oh. My SAT scores barely cracked at a thousand. Colleges weren't recruiting. Were, colleges were recruiting my competitors. I was riding the high of having received surprise admission letters from two colleges I'd half-heartedly applied to. A few weeks ago, a few weeks before, I was on the basketball court court with my high school team, warming up for the home game, cycling through layup lines. My father, all six foot three and two hundred pounds of him emerged from my high school gym's entrance. He slowly walked onto the basketball court, flailing his long arms to get my attention and embarrassing me before what we would call the white judge, classic dad. He couldn't care less what judgmental white people thought about him. He rarely, if ever, put on a happy mask, faked a calmer voice, hid his opinion, or avoided making a scene. I loved and hated my father for living on his own terms in a world that usually denies black people their own terms. It was the sort of defiance that could have gotten him lynched by a mob in a different time and place, or lynched by men with badges today. One thing that really gets me, I'm curious about Ibram X. Kendi's father. And by the way, his name is not Ibram X. Kendi. That's a, that's a change name. I can't tell if his father is a racist not a racist. His father definitely lived during Jim Crow. And his father seemed to have some influence over him, but not really a lot of influence over him. Uh, the, the saying that I loved and hated my father for living on his own terms, I mean, what does that mean exactly? He just lived his life. That's what everyone does. That's what he's supposed to do. Did his father believe he was in trouble? that he could be in trouble by walking out. I, I mean, I'm really curious about his father. I also want to point out that, how did he know that people were judgmental? Isn't he being judgmental by thinking that white people are staring at his father who's running on a, father a big man, 6'3", 200 pounds, 220 or however big he was, running on the court with a letter in hand, waving a letter in hand. Don't you think maybe people aren't judging? Maybe they're curious as to what's going on? I, I don't know if it, it's... Do you see the wording this, this gentleman uses is just... He's throwing stereotypes. He's, he's reading the thoughts of people without... And he does this throughout the book. 
He knows what we're all thinking because we're white. Which, by the way, um, isn't that kind of prejudice? You automatically assume because you're black I'm, I'm judging you? Um, finally, now we hit lie number one. That black people are being killed by police. Being lynched by men with badges. That's an absolute lie. A lot of people believe like a thousand black people are killed a day a year. That's not true. It's a quarter of that. And they believe that black people are killed far more than white po- people. That's a lie. White more white people are killed by police than black people. This is a and the statistics show that that trend is going down. Police are not hunting black people. This is lie number 1. That's a statistic. You can look it up on Statistica. You could go to the J, uh, DOJ.gov. It is written down. The Washington Post actually has statistics. So this is all, that's lie number one. And if he wanted to sit back and prove it, I would like to see a t- statistic before he comes up with anything like that. So right off the bat, we have one lie. And there are going to be a few more here. I jogged over to him before he could flail his, w- his way right up into our lay- layup lines. By the way, um, I jogged over to him before he could flail his way right uh, into our layup line. Yeah, I think most par- parents, I bet you a dollar, even the black parents were actually looking at him, or as Ibram says, judging him. Because that's what people do. They turn and they look. Weirdly giddy, he handed me a ma- brown manila envelope. This came for you today. He motioned me to open the envelope right there at half court as the white students and teachers looked on. So were there any black kids at the school? The white kids and teachers looked on? Um, if there were, were they looking? I pulled out the letter and read it. I had been admitted to Hampton University in Southern Virginia. My immediate shock exploded into unspeakable happiness. I embraced Dad and exhaled, tears mixed with warm-up sweat on my face. The judging wide eyes around us faded. The, ugh, I, the, the, whole, the whole thing here is just, it's so stupid. The judging wide eyes faded. You know why? They found out what it was, and they stopped looking. And guess what? The blacks probably stopped looking also. I thought I was stupid, too dumb for college. Of course, intelligence is subjective as be- is as subjective as beauty, but I kept using objective standards like test scores and report cards to judge myself. No wonder I sent out only two college applications, one to Hampton and the other t- uh, other to the institution I ended up attending, Florida A and M University. Fewer applications meant less rejection, and I fully expected those two historically black universities to reject me. Why would any university want an idiot on their campus who can't understand Shakespeare? It never occurred to me that maybe I wasn't really trying to understand Shakespeare, and that's why I dropped out of my English II International Baccalaureate class during my senior year. Then again, I didn't read much of anything in those years. I I can't tell if Ibram is lying or telling the truth about his high school career. And I think it's probably, he probably was a very good student, maybe underperforming. And I think he was probably like every other 17-year-old. Do you remember when you were 17 and you were like, what am I going to do with my life? I I do. I had the same thing. That's why I didn't go to college right away. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. But for him to sit back and think that he was an idiot, I, I I am really wavering on whether to nail him on this as being lie number two. I won't call it lie number two because I was the same way, but I kind of doubt he was as dumb as he's making, or he was as dumb as he's making himself out to be. And I got news for you. Intelligence is not as subjective as beauty. That is a lie. Intelligence can be measured. Intel Tests do are my objective standards of intelligence. Report cards are objective standards of intelligence unless you get that really special teacher that doesn't like you or that real special that more special teacher that does like you this is why i can't stand the fact they're trying to get rid of the sats and any kind of standardized test 
it is a measure of intelligence. It is a measure of success you would have at a certain college. And not knowing Shakespeare, this isn't this isn't a a sign that you're dumb. I don't I'm not great with math or science. I'm terrible with chemistry. Doesn't mean I'm dumb. I understand Shakespeare better than I understand any of that. Does that make me a dumb person? Of course not. So because he's not very good with with uh, Shakespeare, it does I don't like German literature for that reason. I hate Irish literature, which and which is weird because I actually like English literature from Britain, the the the, the British writers. So again, he he really is kind of. It, it seems like this is a lot of insecurity. And what's disturbing is he's 38 years old when he's writing this book, and it seems like he's still suffering with this insecurity. Maybe if I'd read history then, I'd have learned about the historical significance of the new town my family had moved from, moved to from New York City in 1997. I would have learned about all the Confederate memorials surrounding me in Manassas, Virginia, like Robert E. Lee's Dead Army. I would have learned why so many tourists trekked to Manassas National Battlefield Park to relive the glory of the Confederate victories at the battles of Bull Run during the Civil War. It was there the ge- that General Thomas J. Jackson acquired the nickname Stonewall for his stubborn defense of the Confederacy. Northern Virginians kept the, small, kept the Stonewall intact after all these years. Did anyone notice the irony that at this Martin Luther King or- oratorical contest, my free black life represented Stonewall Jackson High School. This is a real common with a real common thing with CRT. It's to demonize history. Okay. I've been to Gettysburg. I, I like I like history too. But I've been to Gettysburg. I've been to battlefields because that's American history. I've been to Manassas National Park also uh, for the Battle of Bull's Run because it was the most all these things were, the Civil War was the most significant war in American history. Am I a racist because I actually go to Civil War sites? I've been to the Jefferson Memorial too. Am I a racist because Jefferson actually uh, owned slaves? Again, this is Ibram X. Kendi kind of, kind of determining what people are thinking when they go to monuments. He thinks he knows exactly why they're going to the mon- monuments why they're going to the bat- the battlefields, Civil War battlefields. It's all because everyone is a racist. This is, again, nothing more than, assum- nothing more than an, assu- an assumption. The delightful event organizers from Delta Sigma Theta sorority. By the way, this is starting a new section of the introduction. The delightful event organizers from Delta Sigma Theta soror- sorority and the proud dignitaries and the competitors were all seated on the pulpit. The group was too large to say we were seated in the pulpit. The audience sat in the rows that curved around the long, arched pulpit, giving room for speakers to pace to the far sides of the chapel while delivering their talks. Five stairs also allowed us to descend into the crowd if we wanted. The middle schoolers had given their surprisingly mature speeches. The exhilarating children's choir had sung behind us. The audience sat back down, and went silent in anticipation of the three high school orders. I went first, finally approaching the climax of an experience that had already changed my life. From winning the high school competition months before to winning best before the judges at the countrywide competition weeks before, I felt a special rainstorm of academic confidence. If I came out of the experience dripping with confidence for college, then I'd entered high school, then I entered from a high school drought. Even now, I wonder if it was my poor sense of self that first generated my poor sense of people, or was it my poor sense of my people that inflamed my poor sense of self? Like the famous question about the chicken and the egg, the answer is less important than the cycle it describes. Racist ideas make people of color think less of themselves, which makes them care more, makes them more vulnerable to racist ideas. Racist ideas make white people think more of themselves, which further attracts them to racist ideas. Again, this is an assumption that everyone is, has a racist ideas because everything is in his mind has something to do with race. It's circular. Not to mention, if let's just say 
a black person did feel insecure about their race, how is that going to influence how I feel about black people? This is an ex- he is an extreme narcissist when it comes to this stuff because he thinks he knows all the time whatever uh, ev- everyone is thinking. Now, this does, again, this does make sense if you're 17. It doesn't make sense when you're 38. At 38, you're just a narcissist. But Hendy, Kendi here grew up, wrote this book, and proves his narcissism. He has not grown up from 17. And I think that's really kind of disturbing. And I'm wondering why people take him so seriously, because he just seems like he's still a 17-year-old kid. His mentality, his intellect, not, maybe his intellect has grown. But his mentality, his emotions, they've never changed. I thought I was a subpar student and was bombarded with messages from black people, white people, and the media that told me the reason was rooted in my race, which made me more discouraged and less motiv- and a less motivated student, which only further reinforced for me the racist idea that black people just weren't very studious, which made me feel even more despair and indifference. And on it went. At no point was this cycle interrupted by deeper analysis of my own specific circumstances and shortcomings or a critical look at the ideas of society that judged me. Instead, the cycle hardened the racist ideas inside me until I was ready to preach them to others. This paragraph, last paragraph in this section, just proves what I said in the previous paragraph. This is a 38-year-old that never grew out of being 17 never grew out of his insecurities and i would i'll say wisdom of his seven uh, of him when he was a 17 year old he was so narcissistic at 17 that he believed he was right all the way through his 20s and 30s let's start the next section i remember mlk the mlk competition so fondly but when i recall the racist speech i gave i flushed with shame what about what would doc, be dr King's message for the millennium. Let's visualize an angry 71-year-old Dr. King. And I began to mix a remix of King's I Have a Dream speech. So again, changing of history. Dr. King would look today and say, oh my God, what a terrible society we're in. I doubt that. Because Dr. King lived through, uh, lived through all, uh, most of his, lived most of his life Actually, almost all of his life, he lived through Jim Crow. He no, wouldn't see the differences. Matter of fact, I wish that Ibram S. Kendi had lived through Jim Crow so he could see it. Continuing, it was joyous. I started our emancipation from slavery. But now, 135 years later, the Negro is still not free. I was already thundering my angry tone, more Malcolm than Martin. Our youth's minds are still in captivity. I did not say our used minds are in captivity of racist ideas, as I would say now. They think it's okay to be those who are most feared in our society. I said, I said, as if it was their fault they were so feared. They think it's okay not to think, I charged, raising the classic racist idea that black youth don't value education as much as their non-black counterparts. No one seemed to care this well-traveled idea that had flown on antidotes but had never been grounded in proof. Still, the crowd encouraged me with their applause. I kept shooting out unproven and disproven racist ideas about all the things wrong with black youth. Ironically, on the day when all the things right about black youth were on display. I, I gotta tell you something. I wish I had a copy of this speech so I could read that speech. It sounds like the speech of a pissy, entitled 17-year-old kid who's going to college. It's okay to be most feared in our, to be the most feared in our society. I'm not sure what that actually means. Is it white, what white people want to be feared or or is that that what he's saying? He wants white people to be afraid. I, I, I don't quite understand that statement. They think it's okay for us not to think. What is he talking about? They, uh, that's the quote. They think it's okay not to think. What, white people think it's okay that you don't think? No, you are in a scholastic competition. You're in a regional file, a final. 
in a scholastic competition, you just said people were cheering you. You see what the problem is with this guy? He's full of hypocrisies. Things that are actually happening are not what's in his head. He, what he thinks is not really what's happening. It's insane. He's going to college. What is he talking about? Okay, here we go. I started pacing wildly back and forth on the runway for the pulpit, gaining momentum. They think it's okay to climb a high tree of pregnancy. Applause. They think it's okay to confine their dreams to sports and music. Applause. Had I forgotten that I, not black youth, was the one who had confined his dreams to sports? And I was calling black youth they? Who on earth did I think I was? Apparently, my placement on the illustrious stage had lifted me out of the realm of ordinary and thus inferior. Black youngsters and into the realm of the rare and extraordinary. First off, uh, teen pregnancy, confine, confine your life to sports and music. That's personal opportunity. Those are personal choices. You get pregnant. That's not white people's fault that black people get pregnant. White people usually aren't getting, getting them pregnant. And he's blaming his... In, He's blaming his mentality on white people. So he thinks he's a white person and he's stereotyping black people. And maybe he's not stereotyping black people because he's seeing himself as white. Maybe he's stereotyping black people because these are some of the things that were actually happening. Teen pregnancy for the black population was actually pretty high. In 2000 and maybe it's not because he sees himself as a white man which I think is kind of ironic and he's pointing out the teen pregnancy do you see what basically what he's saying is he's got white privilege and he's blaming his observance that there's a high teen pregnancy rate and blacks are going into music and sports instead of education he's blaming that on white his thought his observations on white people that's kind of weird so I've never heard that one before in my applause stoked flights of oratory I didn't realize that to say something is wrong about a racial group is to say something is inferior about a racial group I did not realize okay let me read that again I didn't realize to say something wrong about a racial group is to say something is inferior about the racial group no He's wrong there. It is not teen pregnancy is not it make does not make the racial group inferior. It is a problem with that racial group. And you need to go to the base of that problem, teen pregnancy. Typically teen pregnancy and crime is because of broken homes. That is a problem with that racial group. And whether that be Hispanic, white, um, black, it doesn't make any difference. That doesn't make that group inferior. He's wrong there. How, why, how do I know that? Well, I'm. T well, he's an example of that. He is in a family with two parents. He was raised pretty good. He's in school. He's not married. He hasn't gotten anyone pregnant that I know of his, through his history. So this is wrong. And this is another problem. We can't point out the issues that a specific group might have. We just, because it would be considered making that group inferior and therefore is racist. If I say that, no, we need father, families need to be up, made up of a father and a mother and black families need to stop having children out of wedlock, this will solve their problems. That's not racist. That's not saying they're inferior. It's just saying this is the problem and this is how it can be fixed. Continuing. I did not realize that to say something inferior about a racial group is to say a racist idea. That's not true. That's a lie. I thought I was serving my people when in fact I was serving up racist ideas about my people to my people. The black judge seemed to be eating it up, clapping me on the back for more. I kept giving more. Do you know who actually, this, this paragraph really bothers me. Do you know who said that 
black teens needed to work their education, not get pregnant, not go into crime, that a family needed two parents, that, he, that black children should get married, then have kids once their career is established, Barack Obama, and he said it back in about 2010. So this is not something, is Barack Obama a racist? I would even say that Ibram X. Kendi's speech was not racist until he sat there and said it's racist to say that. Continuing, their minds are being held captive and our adults' adults' minds are right there beside them. I said, motioning to the floor, because they somehow think that the cultural revolution that began on the day of my dream's birth is over. How can it be more? How can it be over when many times we are unsuccessful because we lack intestinal fortitude? Applause, by the way, because we lack intestinal fortitude. That's most people. That's not even a black thing. That's all. The, why am I not a? There are two reasons why I'm I'm not a best-selling author. Two reasons. One reason I may not have the capacity for it, and the second reason I don't have the intestinal fortitude to sit back and write a book. This is not a black-white issue. This is, and it's not racist to say that. Continuing, this is his speech. How can it be over when kids leave their houses not knowing how to make themselves? Only knowing how to make themselves. Only knowing how to not make themselves. Applause. How can it be over if all that is happening in our community, all this is happening in our community? I ask, lowering my voice. So I say to you, my friends, that even though this cultural revolution may never be over, I still have a dream. That's the end of the that's the end of the section. Let's start the next section. And this is the one that gets kind of bizarre. This is where lies come come to play. This whole section here invalidates this entire book, but you still should read it. Next section. I still have a nightmare. The memory of this speech whenever I muster the courage to recall it anew. It is hard for me to believe I finished high school in the year 2000 touting so many racist ideas. These were not racist ideas. A racist culture had handed me the ammunition to shoot black people, to shoot myself, and I took it and I used it. Internalized racism is the real black-on-black crime. Nope, that's not true. You know what's the real black-on-black crime? Murder. That's happening. What's the real black on black crime? Black on black crime. This is a whole problem. Internalized racism is not black and black crime. Implicit bias is not black and black crime. And this is another problem. This is why you've got this defund the police movement. Because it's believed it's all about racism. That's what causes crime. And that's not a thing. I was a dupe, a chump, who saw the ongoing struggles of black people on MLK Day 2000 and decided that black people themselves were the problem. This is the consistent function of racist ideas and of the kind of bigotry more broadly to manipulate us into seeing people as the problem instead of the policies that ensnare them. Now remember that, the policies that ensnare them. This is the root of of the systemic racism they keep talking about. This is why you are a racist if you don't believe in any of the policies that BLM supports, that Ibram X. Kendi supports. This is not a thing. And it, it, it drives me crazy when people are sitting back and saying policies are the problem. This is why we can't get out of the systemic racism issue. There, here comes the big paragraph. The language used by the 45th President of the United States offers a clear example of how the sort of racist language and thinking of words. Long before he became president, Donald Trump liked to say, laziness is a trait in blacks. Eh, There's lie number three. That's not true. This is something that has been debunked by multiple sites. And the president denied, denied ever saying it. This, so right off the bat, you've got a problem here. Long before he became president, uh, I'm sorry, when he decided to run for president, his plan for making America great again, defaming Latinx immigrants as mostly criminals and rapists and demanding billions for border wall to block them. Eh, that's lie number four. That didn't happen. As a matter of fact, if you have any doubt that President 
President Trump never called Hispanics or illegal, even illegal immigrants, rapists and criminals. He was talking about MS-13. You don't believe it? The speech is actually on, the speech is actually on, um, on YouTube. You can listen to the entire speech. He promised a, t I'm, I'm sorry, a wall is not racist. Every, you know who has a wall? Mexico has a wall on their southern border. So this is another lie. Uh, he promised total complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Eh, lie number five. He did not. He actually shut down the Muslim ban, which he called, uh, Trump did call it a Muslim ban, simply because the press wasn't going to stop calling it a Muslim ban banned only five countries in the Muslim world that were terrorist countries. He also banned North Korea and Venezuela. Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UAB, Morocco, and most other majority Muslim countries were not banned. This was a lie. Once he came, pre be continuing, once he became president, he routinely called Black critics, stupid. Eh, that's a lie. He routinely called everybody stupid. He also called them the fake news. He had no, he called Rosie O'Donnell a cow. He was very crass. That's half the reason Donald Trump's not a president. When he called, he called a woman, white woman, during a press conference, stupid. He called people dogs. He is not known for his gentleness of words. This is half the reason he's actually in, uh, that's half the reason he's actually not on social media is his language. He claimed immigrants from Haiti all have AIDS while praising white supremacists as very fine people in the summer of 2017. He, the, the AIDS, all people from Haiti, ha Haiti having AIDS thing, Trump the Trump administration denied that. They didn't know where they even came up with that. And as far as praising white supremacists as very fine people in summer of 2017, his speech was clumsy, but he didn't praise white supremacists. He condemned them. It was in his speech. His speech was actually cut up. If you don't believe that, go to YouTube. It's on YouTube. His full speech. And he condemned white supremacists and the murderer, who was a white supremacist, of that white woman in Charlottesville. This whole paragraph is proving that this country is systemically racist, and everything listed in this paragraph is either untrue, a lie, or unproven. And there are only two things that are unproven, and everything was that was denied. The Haiti, uh, all people from Haiti have AIDS, and the... Um, laziness of trait and blacks and the laziness of trait and blacks they said that didn't happen and that wasn't the trump organization that was like snopes so again you cannot base your philosophy on a lie and if you think if he thinks that this paragraph proves proves systemic racism you've got to say oh wait a minute this is none of this is true so maybe systemic racism doesn't exist through it all Whenever someone pointed out the obvious, Trump responded with variations of a familiar refrain. No, no, I'm not racist. I'm the least race, racist person that you ever interviewed, that you've never, ever met, at that you've ever encountered. Trump's behavior may be exceptional, but his denials are normal. When racist ideas resound, denials that those ideas are racist typically follow. When racist policies resound, denials that those policies are racist also follow, uh, follow. Denial is the heartbeat of racism, beating across ideologies, races, and nations. I, you know, yes or no here. White supremacists are pretty open about their racism. And most racists are quite open about their racism. I, I know a couple of racists. They're not white supremacists, but I know a couple of racists, and they're very open about it. They have no problem with that. But notice something here. Denial that you're a racist makes you a racist. So to be an anti-racist, you have to admit you're a racist. And if you deny being a racist, 
you're a racist. So if you admit you're a racist, you're a racist. If you deny being a racist, you're a racist. This is a circular reasoning here. You can't win. You can't get out of it. So I'm, I'm, I'm a racist because I don't think I'm a racist. Now, in fact, I'm pretty positive. You can't win here. This is the problem. This is why these guys call everyone a racist and they think they can. And notice, again, when racist policies, what are racist policies? They're the policies that Ibram X. Kendi believes in. I'd like, I would like Ibram X. Kendi to show me a policy. He does it later in the book. To show me a policy that is racist. And he does in the book. And we'll, we, I, we won't talk too much about that. Continuing, it is beating within us, racism. Many of us who strongly call out Trump's racist ideas will strongly deny our own. How often do we become reflexively defensive when someone calls something we've done or said racist? How many of us would agree with this statement? Racist isn't a descriptive word. It's a pejorative word. It is the equivalent of saying, I don't like you. These are actually the words of the white supremacist supremacist Richard Spencer, who, like Trump, identifies as not racist. How many of us who despise the Trumps and the white supremacists of the world share their self-definition of not racist? What's the problem with being not racist? It is a claim that signifies neutrality. I am not a racist, but neither am I aggressively against racism. But there is no neutrality in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist is not not racist. It is anti-racist. What's the difference? One endorses either the idea of racial hierarchy as a racist or racial equality as an anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in groups of people as a racist or locates the roots of a problem in power and policies as an anti-racist. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is no in-betweens safe space of in-between safe space of not of a not racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. This may seem harsh, but it's important as the onset that we apply one of the core principles of anti-racism, which is to return the word racist itself back to its proper usage. Racist is not, as Richard Spencer argues, pejorative. It is not the worst word in the English language. It is not the equivalent of a slur. It's a dis- it is descriptive. And the only way to undo racism is to consistently identify and describe it and then dismantle it. The attempt to turn this usefully descriptive term into an almost unusable slur is, of course, designed to do the opposite, to freeze us into inaction. Okay, here is Ibram X. Kendi's thesis for how to be an anti-racist. And it's a really bad thesis because it's based on untested assumptions. Obi-Wan Kenobi once said to the newly indoctrinated Darth Vader, when Darth Vader said to Obi-Wan, you're either with me or against me, Obi-Wan said, only the dark, dark side talks in absolutes. According to Kendi, one cannot be just not racist because that makes you a racist. It's mentality. That's the problem. This is the biggest problem I have with this argument. It is you're basing someone is a racist not on their actions, but on their mentality. All right? So, for example, I don't, I'm not a racist. My actions show that I am not a racist. But because I refuse to be an anti-racist, and we'll get to that one in a second, I cannot be, I, I am still racist. I'm racist no matter what. Okay, my actions make absolutely no difference. 
Now, let me argue again against this crap, and this is going to take a while. You can be neutral on racism. You can just, not, and being neutral on racism means you're not a racist. I can, and I don't think racism is a huge problem in this country. I don't think it's been a huge problem since, in my life, 70s and 80s it was an issue, and then it just got better and better as it went. You know, what I'm doing right now, sitting here and disagreeing with Kendi, makes me a racist, according to him. Now, he mentioned something called a racial hierarchy. What the hell is a racial hierarchy? He talks about racial equality. We have racial equality. It's in the Constitution, for Christ's sake. Kendi's answer is in the last sentence, it's about policies. And it's not about equality, because we already have that. It's about equity. Policies that Kendi likes, supposedly, will lead to equity. I say supposedly because it never actually does. Policies Kendi's likes are policies that BLM likes, which is a Marxist organization. They're Marxist policies. And because I disagree with Marxist policies that will supposedly lead to equity, by the way, Marxist policies never lead to equity, then I am a racist. And because I'm against those policies, I'm actually an active anti-racist. The left has a lot of skill of using words. As I've already pointed out, equality and equity sound alike. And the left is trying to make them interchangeable. But those words are not interchangeable. Equality of opportunity and equality under the eyes of the law are very different from equity of outcome which is what the left is really pushing. And they'll mix equality and equity. And if you listen to Biden, he mixes them up. He does it by accident, but he mixes them up also. Okay, equity is considered the new equality. Equality is, in, is what this country was actually striving for, not equity. Everyone has the same chances. Everyone is looked at in the same way by the government. Everyone is looked in the same way by the law. We all have the same opportunities as, as anyone else. The only thing that stops one from being something is their capacity and their will, what they will, are willing to do to get it. Capacity is one's built-in ability. So, for example, I would want to be a basketball player. I would prac I can have the will to be a basketball player. But I'll never have the capacity to be a basketball player. It's just not something that's ever going to happen. I'm short. I can't jump. I'm not that athletic. I'm not as athletic as I used to be. And I can't shoot a basketball. I can't dribble a basketball. Ditch diggers. A lot of uh, the equity people will sit there and say, ditch diggers don't get paid what they deserve because they work so hard. You know, working hard is not enough. There's also got to be a value to society. Dicking ditches and flipping hamburgers does not deserve equitable, it's not going to have equitable outcomes to someone like Oprah Winfrey. That's not going to happen because Oprah provides more value to society than the ditch digger down the street. Just like she provides more, uh, just like she provides more value to society than I do helping people with their computer problems. With Kendi's equity, the government will basically take all of Oprah's money and give it to the ditch diggers so Oprah can actually earn, as, will earn as much as the ditch diggers. That's the idea of equity with Kendi. You know what the problem with that is? And it's happened everywhere. Is Oprah is just going to say, why am I working so hard? Ronald Reagan did that. Ronald Reagan used to be a Democrat. And California, trying to become equitable, decided to tax the living crap out of anyone earning a certain amount of money and redistributing it. This happened way back in Reagan's days. Before he became governor, he became a Republican. He refused to work. Who actually provided more benefits to society? Reagan or some ditch digger or some burger flipper down the street. 
Um, so here's the reality. Oprah provides the country more. She gets more. That's how it works. Equity is exploitation of is exploitation is a term that is being exploited by the left to inflame the greed and jealousy of those who don't have the capacity to be billionaires, including me. But the kicker is, I already know I'm not going to be a billionaire. I already know I don't have the capacity, and I don't have the drive to do it. And that's not a bad thing. It's just what I am. And I'm not greedy, and I don't, I'm not jealous of the guy next door who owns his house and, and has far more money than I. I'm not. I have to, but I have to, I have the ability, I have the equality of opportunity to try if I want to, and to profit from that. Ibram wants to take all of that away. And that's not a good thing. Okay. So let's get, let's get, let's move on. We're doing pretty good here. We're going to, we're actually, we are going to finish this. Here's the next section. The common idea of claiming colored blindness is akin to a notion of being not racist. As with not racist, the colorblind individual, by abstens ostensibly failing to see race, fails to see racism and falls into the race of passivity. That's not true. That is an absolute lie. One of the reasons I don't use the N-word, even in a joke, is because I see it as a racist term. It's an ugly term. It doesn't mean I. you can use it if you want. I just probably won't hang out with you a lot. We see race all the time, and we see injustices all the time. My fiancé was speaking to a, a woman while we were getting coffee in Spanish because the woman speaks Spanish better than she speaks English and another woman walked up to her and said you know you're in America you shouldn't be speaking you shouldn't be speaking Spanish and I looked at the woman and I said you know what you are um, we're in America and she's got the she can speak to Spanish to whoever she wants and in America you don't have to sit there and actually stalk her it's weird you're spying on her the reality is, yes, when we see racism, typically we do point it out, but we have to see it. And this is the other thing that I can't stand about the Biden administration. They see race everywhere. White supremacy last week was announced by Merrick Garland as the biggest factor on American domestic terrorism. Really? Really? Can you name a group for me? I, I, I don't recall seeing a lot of white supremacist groups out there. I see a lot of Antifa and BLM burning crap down, but I don't see a lot of white supremacists. I don't need, I need to call out racism when I see it. Kendi wants you to call out racism when it's not there or when the actions don't determine racism. This is just a really weird thing. For me, I just don't understand this. And this is what invalidates it. It is actions that determine the person. It is not inaction that determines. It's not even inaction that determines the person. If a white guy starts being a racist and I don't feel like getting into a fight, I I'm not going to say anything. Probably That's not true. I probably will because I got a big mouth. Ask Dave if you ever get a chance to see him or text with him or uh, engage in comments. But the thing is, it is just, I, you, you can't sit there and, and, and just call everyone a racist, and that's the base. That's the standard. Okay, let me continue. The language of colorblindness, like the language of not racist, is to mask, is to mask, is a mask to hide racism. Again, this is the circular logic. I have to admit to be a racist, to be an anti-racist, but if I say I'm not a racist, I'm automatically a racist. See, the, the, it's a circular logic. I, you can't get around it. Our Constitution is colorblind, U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Harlan proclaimed in his dissent to Plessy versus Ferguson. 
the case that legalized Jim Crow segregation in 1896. The white race deems itself to be a dominant race in this country, Justice Harlan went on. No, I doubt not. It will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage. End quote. A colorblind constitution for white supremacist America. No, this is wrong. John Harlan was a racist. We've been talking about that for the last 100 years. 120 years. He is a racist. And he made a racist decision. The Constitution is not racist. The Constitution does not talk about race at all. And that was done on purpose. Because Thomas Jefferson and the other founding fathers thought that that slavery was wrong. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. He might have had women with a slave. You know, by women, babies with a slave. He wasn't a racist. He, they sat back. The Federalist Papers, a lot of the Federalist Papers, are based on how do we end slavery because slavery does not meet the goals of the Constitution. So because a racist made a crappy law 150 years after uh, 100 years after the constitution and 30 years after a civil war where 600,000 or I don't know 900,000 Americans died to end slavery he's determining the constitution is a, 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 a document of white supremacists this is again rewriting history or not evaluating history correctly there's no question John Harlan, I'll say it again, John Harlan was a racist. And what he did in Plessy versus Ferguson was racist and wrong and evil. And historians acknowledge that. Okay, that ends the uh, one section. We're almost done. we got a page left. The good news is that racist and anti-racist are not fixed identities. Oh, goody. We can be racist one minute and an anti-racist the next. What we say about race, what we do about race, in each moment determines what, not who, we are. Okay, so what he's basically doing is, he's saying, actions prove you're not a racist. Prove you are not a racist or an anti-racist. But meanwhile, actions don't prove you're not a racist. Again, double-edged sword. So if I don't do anything through my life that is racist, that does not prove me that I'm not a racist. That doesn't prove I'm not a racist. I used to be a racist most of the time. Newsflash, you're still a racist. I am changing. I am no longer identifying with racists by claiming to be not racist. See the weird, see the weird circle, circle there? So he's he used to be a racist, but now he's admitting a ra- he's a racist. So he's not racist anymore. Okay, you tell me if you figured that out. I'm no longer speaking through the mask of racial neutrality. I am no longer manipulated by racist ideas to see racial groups as the problems. I no longer believe a black person cannot be a racist. I am no longer policing my every action around an imagined white or black judge, trying to convince white people of my equal humanity, trying to convince black people I am representing the race well. Here's a newsflash. White people don't need you to convince them of anything. I don't need you to convince me you're a racist or not a racist. I don't need to convince you I'm a racist or not a racist. I know I'm not a racist, and I don't need to convince you of that. I don't need to convince you of anything. It's kind of the same thing with the the freaking shots, the, uh, the vaccines. I don't need to prove to you I got a vaccine. I said I got a vaccine. That's all you need to know. It, it, it's just it's such a tired argument. White people of my equal human. By the way, um, most white people actually think your your humanity is equal to ours. I do. Uh, most people, I most white people I know, Hispanics too. They think your humanity. You have the same humanity as anybody else. These people, they don't. They don't freaking just back up. And when I say these people, because I know that can be construed as racist, I mean these anti-racist folks. Don't see that. They don't understand that your actions determine everything. And you know what? We don't have expectations. 
We aren't looking for, this is the problem with cancel culture. You're always looking for something. Well, here's a newsflash. Conservatives typically don't look for anything. It's you folks that keep looking for something. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Where are we? I no longer care about how the actions of other black individuals reflect on me because they don't. Actions of other black people do not reflect on you. All those videos I see on Twitter where black people are beating the crap out of somebody, that does not mean Ibram X. Kendi is going out tomorrow and beating up. Just like it doesn't mean that my neighbor who's black is going to do the same thing. That it's just It's not a thing. It doesn't mean that if I'm in a black neighborhood, I'm going to feel less secure because there might be a, a couple of bad eggs there. That's not how it works. Since none of us are race representatives, nor is any individual responsible for some el someone else's racist ideas, I've come to see that the movement from racist to anti-racist is always ongoing. It requires understanding and snubbing of racism based on biology, ethnicity, body, culture, behavior, color, space, and class. And beyond that, it means standing ready to fight at racism's intersections and other bigotry. Okay, here, here's, here's what he's doing. This is, by the way, intersectionality is what he's talking about here. Okay, intersectionality started in the 70s where each group is broken down into a certain intersection. And someone's victim status is based off that intersection. What he has done right now is biology, which by the way is transphobe. Biology is not a thing because you can be 50 different sexes now. Ethnicity, body, culture, behavior, color, space, race, He's already named eight different intersectional groups. He's basically creating a caste system. Do you know who else creates a caste system? North Korea. North Korea has 50 different caste systems in it. 50, and they're all based on this crap. The United States, before intersectionality became popular, never had any of that crap. It was considered taboo to have a caste system. Like, let's say, North Korea or Russia or the Soviet Union or India. India's got a caste system. Theirs is a little more broad than um, North Korea's and Soviet Union's. But this is the whole thing. He is finding this problem in all of these different castes. That's a really bad thing. It's very de de divisive. And this is the kind of stuff that starts civil wars. And what's worse if you don't believe in it, you are a racist. Okay, here's the last section, then we'll be done. This book is ultimately about the basic struggle we're all in, the struggle to be fully human and to see that others are fully human. I share my own journey of being raised in a dueling racial consciousness of the Reagan era black middle class when right turning in onto the 10 lane highway of anti black racism, a highway mysteriously free of police and gun and free on gas and veering off onto the two-lane highway of anti-white racism where gas is rare and police are everywhere before finding and turning down the unlit dirt road of anti-racism. After taking this grueling journey to the dirt road of anti-racism, humanity can come upon the clearing of a potential future, an anti-racist world in all its imperfect beauty, it can become real if we focus on the power instead of the people. If we focus on the changing policy instead of the groups of people, there, it's possible if we overcome our cynicism about the permanence of racism. We know how to be racist. We know how to pretend not to be racist. Now let's know how to be an anti-racist. Okay, um, I, this quote really drives me nuts. It can become real if we focus on the power of, on power instead of the people. In other words, control. If we focus on changing policy instead of groups of people. Again, policy is racist if they don't agree with the policy. And here's another question. How about, can we focus on 
either all four or none. Uh, for the power instead of the people, I, I, that bothers me because it's basically centralized government is what they're talking about here. And over the individual. That's disturbing. And policy instead of groups of people. But we don't focus on groups of people. We can focus on policy, but let's talk about policy. We can't do that under Ibram's context. It's got to be his policy, and that's it. So what can we get from this? And I think we've learned a lot just from the introduction. And it's a very disturbing introduction, and it really does lead us to what's going to be in the rest of the book. So first, he doesn't seem to have grown up from the insecurities he had when he was young. His insecurities involved his intelligence and his race. And he blamed his insecurities he, on white people. He thought that white people actually caused his insecurities. The next thing we can see is that Ibram X. Kendi is a racist who became a racist based off of his stereotypes that he had of white people. He hides his racism by calling everyone else a racist, whether they are a racist or not. To Kendi, racism Kendi to Kendi, racism is as much of a person uh, than let's say an arm is of a person we all have it and we can't get rid of it it's always going to be there the other thing Kendi uses two things to prove his point neither is a great technique he uses circular reasoning and this is I can tell you most of the race theory out there uses this type of circular theory uh, reasoning and it's it's really bad it just doesn't work but they continue to use it even if, when people point it out I mean this isn't something that people don't see if you agree with him you are saying you are a racist which makes you possibly an anti-racist if you agree with anti-racist uh, policies if you uh, disagree with him, you're a racist for saying that you're not a racist. There's no, there's a no-win scenario for white people. You're demonized one way or the other. And demonization is what this book's really about. In this book, Ibram X. Kendi talks about discrimination as being a way for reparations. Discriminating against white people. That's really disturbing considering all the institutions in our country right now that are actually embracing this crap. We also learned that Kendi is an intersectional. He believes that we should break people into groups, creating almost a caste system. This becomes also very big throughout his book. BLM has done this. It's... A lot of people have been really turned off of BLM because of this. And Kendi disregards a person's individuality. Individuality is not a factor. It's all about the intersectional group that the person belongs to. As if all white people. What's interesting about this problem is that it assumes that all white people, no matter what genetic material may be within them, European, German, Italian, British, um, Irish, Scottish, it doesn't make any difference. American! Because we are actually American. I, I would consider myself more of an American than any other genetic area in my life i i i'm i'm a mix of i'm 40 percent germanic and i'm 40 percent irish i don't consider myself germanic or irish i consider myself american i was born in america 
My parents were American for the most part. But he ignores all that. It's just white, black, brown, yellow, red. That's all he sees. And that individual, that person falls into that group, so that group determines what that person's actions are. It's kind of a sad thing. He also does this, and the media does this all the time. He blurs the lines between equality and equity. They're both not the same thing. They're in complete opposites of each other. <coughs> As a matter of fact, we must destroy equality for equity. And this is in his book. So as far as the world is concerned, Oprah Winfrey should be earning the same as me, even though she's done far more in her life. He detests American history. He dismisses anyone who appreciates American history. And in certain cases, even in this introduction, he actually changes American history. And we see on the left, this is a very common thing. Finally, he is basing his entire thesis on lies. I didn't count how many lies, but there were at least seven, eight of them. And if you critically read any philosophy, it could be Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Nietzsche, St. Thomas Aquinas, any type of philosophy. Oh, Thomas Jefferson's philosophy. If you read any philosophy and you're critical on that philosophy, you'll find good things and bad things out of every philosophy in the world. The Bible, the, the biblical philosophy. But what he is actually doing is just creating a philosophy based off lies. Now, not misinterpretations, because the lies that I actually pointed out to, you could easily do a Google search and find what actually happened and find facts on them. Not inaccuracies, because this isn't 1980. We can actually Google things up and look them up but lies, because either he was too lazy. I, I Listen, Ibram X. Kendi is a freaking doctor. I'm uh, has a PhD. I don't consider him a doctor, but he has a PhD. He knows how to do research. He didn't do either, didn't do any research, which I don't believe, or just made things up, which would be lying. He lied. And again, he, he left out some of his lies, could statistically be proven, and he didn't prove it. For example, when he said that um, uh, police officers are the modern-day lynchers, I well, I mean, statistically, you can actually prove or disprove that. And he didn't bother bringing any of that up. This stuff is evil. And if you read the book, I would hope it would be when you read the book. I think everyone should read this book because it is the modern day philosophy. You'll find that, um, uh huh? Where did he come up with some of this stuff? Because the book goes into granular, granular detail and he skips things, he lies about things based on conjecture. And it makes the book even more irrelevant than it really is. I think all these people who supported, and I there's a video, I'm going to play an uh, audio of something on Monday where a admiral was questioned about recommending Ibram X. Kendi's book to all, all personnel of the Navy. And the senator or representative asked, did you even read the book? He wouldn't answer. I do not think people actually know 
the philosophy of being an anti-racist. I think they're just going along with it. And I think if people read this, they'd say, uh, no, that's not me and that's not this country. Okay, that's it. We've done our Saturday special. I would tell you to, you know, where to download or listen to this podcast and my website and whatever. I'm not going to do that today because it's Saturday and I've already gone up one hour and 15 minutes. Oh, my glory. Dave's going to be so pissed. I hope you guys have a great weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday. I hope you enjoyed this, and I really do recommend you read the book. I know a lot of people don't want to give this guy money. He's already rich, so just read the book. This is Gene, and you've listened to Dumbasses Talking Politics.